In medieval academic prefaces to authoritative classical texts written by authors like Ovid, Virgil, Cicero, Statius, Lucan, Juvenal, and of course Horace, uh, one of the key questions in these prefaces posed about the text being introduced is, to what part of philosophy does the book belong? with answers ranging from natural philosophy and metaphysics to logic or ethics. When poetic texts, either in Latin or the vernacular, are the objects of such prefatory discussion, the answer to this question is always to ethics or moral philosophy, since the reading of poetry was understood to compel readers to engage viscerally and affectively with texts, leading to ethically informed choices about identifying with or rejecting models of behavior represented there. Now, for those of you in the seminar, you, you heard a little bit about Catherine Brown's um, description of ways medieval readers would engage with texts. While scholars have amply examined the role of the reading of poetry as ethics in both medieval literary theory and practice, what is less acknowledged is what is at stake in the writing of poetry that is, that poetry also may be judged and practiced in terms that are ethically based, that poetic theory draws on the conceptual world of virtue and vice, of sin and redemption, to talk about poetic composition, whose own virtue or vice is at once moral and aesthetic. Medieval poetics, largely uh, an amalgam of Ciceronian rhetoric, and Horatian advice about proper and improper modes of composition, privileged an aesthetic that prized structural coherence, a proper fit between linguistic register, character, and genre, meaning a tragic hero should not speak in the rustic language of a peasant, for example. And it also prized consistence, being that there should be no abrupt changes of subject matter. It was recognized that texts possessed scenes but such joinings were to be negotiated with subtlety and not marked or unduly exaggerated, lest the text resemble what medie medieval theoreticians called a ragged garment. Central to medieval poetic theory is a system of five or six vices, vikya, or uh, sins, peccata, of composition that were culled from a close reading of the first 37 lines of Horace's Art of Poetry. Horace was treated as an auctor, uh, an authoritative voice, a core classical writer whose works were taught, read, and commented upon in medieval schools and became part of the intellectual apparatus of any literate, educated person in the Middle Ages. The commentary tradition on the art of poetry is particularly rich and understudied. There are at least 29 known commentaries, all anonymous, written between the 11th and 15th centuries, with the bulk of them dating to the 12th and 13th centuries. Actually, one, one of them from the 15th century is a human, an Italian humus, humanist one is not anonymous. I should correct that. Um, today, my aim is to suggest the degree to which this rich commentary tradition on Horace's art of poetry constructs an ambiguous relationship between the ethics and aesthetics of writing poetry as it developed in the 12th and 13th centuries. I also want to pay attention to the possible complication of that relationship by new emerging commentary on Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, as well as by the burgeoning religious discourse on that both theorized and systematized thought on the virtues and vices. Then I will turn to a 14th century Castilian poetic text, The Book of Good Love, to explore how the theoretical and conceptual linking of poetic and moral vice plays out in a text that deliberately conflates poetic and moral sins. Horace begins his art of poetry with advice related to the necessity of creating a poem that is congruous, that is consistent in content, structure, style, and tone, advice that his medieval readers organized into a system of virtues and vices of writing. Before telling the novice how to compose a poem, he sets forth a series of graphic exempla of poetic and artistic incompetence. The art opens with the famous image of the monstrous result of a lack of artistic control. And I actually have a couple of manuscript images to show you because medieval readers 
uh, often have this image as a, uh, an intro to the text itself. Uh, this is from a, a late 12th century um, manuscript in Florence, um, likely written in Italy. Um, and it's not a great quality image here, um, but you can't really see it. But across the face of, of that woman, um, the word kamena, the name of the muse for poetry, is written. Um, and there's another clearer manuscript image, because it's a text that I worked with. Um, this one is from the El Escorial Library in Spain, and it's also late 12th century, likely written in France. So this image here is uh, an, a, a graphic illustration of the following lines from Horace's text. If a painter wished to join a human head to a horse's neck, and plaster all kinds of feathers on limbs gathered from all over, so that a woman beautiful on top ended foully in a black fish, let in for a viewing. Could you hold back a laugh, my friends?" End quote. These first five lines of Horace's Art of Poetry um, portray a laughably grotesque figure of deformed composition that embodies for medieval commentators the first vice of what they called incongruous placing of parts. The second vice of composition is that of incongruous digression, which comes about in Horace's text when the will of the unsuspecting poet or artist becomes so distracted and overwhelmed by the voluptuous insistence of his subject matter that he deviates from the flow of discourse and inserts a purple patch. Purple patches do not pertain to the topic at hand. So instead of creating unity, purple patches call attention to the seams or grooves between themselves and the rest of the poem. The third vice, called obscure brevity, is explicitly condemned in both Horace and his commentators. Uh, the proof text for this comes from the Art of Poetry lines 21 and 22, where the, Horace presents a potter who fails to turn out the large wine jar that he had intended to make, and instead produces a much reduced pitcher. So this uh, obscure brevity uh, is overzealous abbreviation, uh, or even unintentional abbreviation. And sometimes, conversely and counterintuitively, it can be a, a form of excessive amplification, born out of a misdirected desire to represent things as apparently correct or true, such that one narrates more things than are required, and thereby renders the whole obscure. The fourth vice, incongruous change of style, is exemplified both by the deviation of particular characters from the modes of speech appropriate to them by means of an insertion of properties from another style where they do not belong. This is where you have the humble character, um, like a peasant, speaking in full tragic high style. This, is, this, this vice also uh, in, encapsulates a, a falling away from perfection uh, within each of the three levels of style, meaning from the grand, middle, uh, and low style. Such a failure to observe the properties of style results in a double vice, according to the author of a 14th century theoretical compendium of, on poetics called the Tria Sunt. Um, he calls it with uh, the meaning, both the meaning and words run contrary to the art. What another earlier commentator calls another mode of incongruity. The fifth vice, incongruous, or sometimes called monstrous variation of subject matter, is based on the Horatian proof text of, quote, the man who tries to vary a single subject in monstrous fashion is like a painter adding a dolphin to the woods, a boar to the waves. That's from Art of Poetry, lines 2930. A 13th century commentator describes this variation as an interruption of the subject matter by something interposed that introduces contradiction into the fabric of the text. And the sixth and final vice is that of non-completion, or what's also called incongruous imperfection of the work, caused either by the ignorance or negligence of the artisan. The Horatian example is that of the sculptor who only does the hair and nails of his statue and fails to complete the whole figure. Scholars have argued that in introductions that precede commentaries to the art of poetry, the book, 
although it is a poem about poetry, is deemed to have little to do with ethica, with ethics, but rather should be understood as dealing with composition and literature, and classified therefore under logic, since both of these deal with structured verbal expression. However, a closer look at the introductions to the Ars Poetica, especially those from the 12th century, reveals an awareness of the centrality of ethics to medieval readers of the art of poetry. For some commentators, like one 12th century uh, commentator, this is indeed the case. Uh, I'm going to go to the next quote. As he says, uh, and I'm, I'm only reading English, the Latin will be up on the, on the screen. And this book belongs to logic because here people are taught not about moral formation, but about the composition of words for the purpose of making poems, end quote. This rejection of the possibility of the art occupying a moral function seems to point to the fact that it could be considered to be doing just that. In another 12th century commentary, uh, the commentator assigns the text principally to logic because it concerns reading aloud. But then he adds that it can also be assigned to ethics. On the contrary, Oh, sorry, I don't have a slide for this one. On the contrary, it can also be assigned to ethics because he aims to reprove the faulty morals and habits of poets, end quote. This ethically informed classification of the art continues on into the 14th century with a, one popular commentary introduction explaining its final cause as to avoid vices and choose virtues, and thus the part of philosophy to which it belongs is ethics. It is not surprising that readers of the art of poetry would have embraced it as a morally relevant text, given the reception of Horace's other works, especially the epistles, that were seen as providing guidance in ethical choices in pursuit of what is good and useful. As both early and later commentaries describe, Horace as moralist in the epistles intended to uproot the vices and plant or sow virtues a formulation echoed exactly in commentaries to the art of poetry, uh, where in one of them, he, the commentator says, first he teaches what not to do, and later what should be done, since we ought to uproot vices and then plant virtues. Given that commentaries on the epistles could often be found in manuscripts together with important commentaries on both the satires and the art of poetry, and that commentators on the epistles were deeply familiar with the art, it is not surprising that the moral and the, ars and the aesthetic are not easily disentangled. In addition to the invocation in commentary of the writing of poetry as an act that is at once aesthetic and moral, the reading of Horace was also firmly embedded in treatises of moral philosophy that examined in detail the workings and categorization of the cardinal virtues and corresponding vices. For example, in an anonymous compendium called, from the 12th century called Dogma of Moral Philosophers, examples from Horace, mostly from the odes and epistles, but also from the art, are so ubiquitous in the illustrations of particular points of moral conduct that Horace needs no introduction and is simply referred to as poeta in the same way that Aristotle is philosophus. While Horace was embraced as a quotable source for moral teaching, the language of Christian ethics also comes to color discussions of the vices and virtues of writing in commentaries on the art of poetry. In the discussion of the opening lines of the art, that monstrous image that I, I showed you earlier, um, several commentators seize upon the text's evocation of the painters wanting to create such a hybrid creature. In a 13th century commentary, this, the opening image illustrates the connection made between poetic <coughs> error and the disordered will of the artist, whether poet or painter. Okay, now I'm gonna, sorry. Okay, by, uh, I'm quoting here from this 13th century commentary. By this metaphor of the painter, the author uh, sets aside the first vice, which is called monstrous joining of parts, or incongruous composition of the subject matter. He shows this vice first in the painter by the example of a similitude, 
And then in the writer's intention, if he wants, that if he wants is quoting Horace there. Why does Horace say he wants? It is because the will alone is at issue in these examples and not any necessity, for there is no necessity in voluntary movements, but mere will alone. The 12th century, uh, another 12th century anonymous commentary adds that this desiring on the part of the painter arises not from reason, but only from will. Uh, okay, so this commentary complicates this sinful willfulness of the painter by casting it as akin to the irrational carnal desires of women. For when a painter paints a monster of this sort, something that has never been seen, it is the will alone that is the cause for why he does this. And like a certain woman says in Juvenal, and here he quotes from Juvenal satires, she says, so I desire, so I command. The will stands in for reason, and thus the painter can say, it pleases me. Drawing on Augustine, sin for many medieval thinkers is located in the will and not in the reason or passions an idea that later became central to Franciscan writers on ethics, who also accepted the thesis that moral virtue belongs primarily to the will. The relationship of Christian theological understandings of sin and virtue, and more philosophically driven conceptions of virtue and vice, you know, arising out of Plato and Aristotle and often transmitted through Seneca and Cicero to the Middle Ages, um, so both Christian theological understandings and philosophical ways of thinking about uh, v virtue and vice and sin derived from pagan classical sources. These are all very entangled in the 12th and 13th centuries when medieval moral theory was evolving. Not only do theological treatises on virtue and vice, such as those by Albert the Great or William of Auvergne, interweave comments, moments of commentary on Aristotle's ethics, into their discussions of sin and vice, but definitions of virtue are often drawn equally from Christian and pagan sources. Vice and sin are so close for one 12th century theologian, Hugh of St. Victor, that to paraphrase him in his text on the sacraments, he says, a vice has an ancillary in the genesis of sin. It is an underlying corruption from which sin arises through consent but it does not seem to be a sin in itself, and indeed seems in a positive sense to offer an opportunity for a reward and crown when the action it might naturally cause is successfully checked. For Hugh, virtue is discussed in Augustinian terms of charity as love of God and neighbor, rather than deriving from a pagan philosophical discourse. Christian thinkers developed a variety of strategies to negotiate the differences between ethics deriving from authoritative pagan sources and their own theologically derived system. From Augustine, who casts pagan virtues as akin to vices, to Aquinas, who attempts to maintain that there is no conflict between religious, the religious notion of sin and the philosophical notion of vice, theologians grappled with the relationship of sin, vice, reason, and will. Aquinas argues that both are contrary to human nature and reason, and thus to God's law in which reason rules, although he does privilege the theological view of sin as an offense against God to be more fitting since God's law encompasses much that extends beyond reason. Sin as deviation from human nature and reason is also articulated by William of Auvergne, Bishop of Paris from 1228 to 1249, in his lengthy treatise on the virtues, where a graphic where he invokes the kind of monstrosity embodied in Horace's opening hybrid as a, a graphic illustration of the falling away from virtue into vice. For William, one of the many names for virtue is decor, or fittingness, appropriateness, on account of the principle that virtue consists of that which is fitting to human nature, and vice is that which is, as he says, alien to and discrepant with human nature. He then goes on to illustrate how vice lodged in the human soul is akin to the mixing of animal and human bodies. He, I'm quoting him here. And in general, the monstrousness of brutish morals is to the human mind like the monstrousness of the members of brute animals to the human body. 
For just as the head of a jackass on the human body would be terribly ill-fitting and very unsuitable, so a brutish or foolish mind is in the human soul. William's moralizing example of the construction of a hybrid monstrosity is a figure for both brutish morals and lack of aesthetic decorum complements a developing discourse of commentary on Aristotle's ethics after partial translations of books one to three in the 12th century and fuller translations that arrived in the late 12th century and the 1240s. As one scholar has discussed, passages in the ethics where craftsmen like the lyre player or builder who perform their craft well or badly function as examples for medieval thinkers of how one can conceptualize the active instantiation of virtues. As Aristotle says in book two of the ethics, quote, men will be good or bad builders as a result of building well or badly. This then is the case with the virtues also. By doing the acts that we do in our transactions with other men, we become just or unjust. And by doing the acts that we do in the presence of danger, and by being habituated to feel fear or confidence, we become brave or cowardly, end quote. Aristotle complicates this analogy later in book two, when he distinguishes between the goodness that arises in the arts when they are done well, from the conditions that characterize acts performed in accord with virtue, but whose agents may lack the virtuous qualities to render them fully virtuous. And further on in book six, this distinction is fleshed out by attributing to art a, quote, reasoned capacity to make, end quote, as opposed to the acting of practical wisdom that is, as Aristotle says, a true and reasoned state of capacity to act with regard to the things that are good or bad for men. Such prominence accorded to the making of things, be they buildings, songs, paintings, or to extend the analogy, um, poems, uh, in this seminal text on ethics, uh, this opens the door to much reflection by medieval commentaries uh, in the 12th and 13th centuries on the relationship between moral wisdom and knowledge and the knowledge involved in crafting things, thus creating a space for the exploration of how aesthetic making can be moralized and vice versa, how moral action may or may not be cognate with aesthetic norms a dynamic that we have also seen is inherent in the assimilation of Horatian poetic decorum, where the vices of writing are canonized through the analogies of painting, sculpting, or casting of an urn at the beginning of the art of poetry. Aquinas, one of the most important commentators on the ethics, structures the distinction between making and acting around that of the thing made and the agent of its making. For Aquinas, uh, virtue resides in the maker of an object, whereas the good of the object itself is external to its maker. I'm quoting him here. Hence, in such actions, the good consists in the object made. It is enough for the good of art, therefore, that the things made be good. But virtues are principles of action that do not go out into the external matter, but remain in the agents. Hence, actions of this kind are perfections of the agents. So the good of these actions is identical with the agents themselves." End quote. In an anonymous commentary from around 1280 by a master at the University of Paris, Aquinas's careful decoupling of the artifacts from the moral actor is echoed but complicated with the commentator arguing for an ethics of artistic creation that is both moral and artistic, but, but which resides both in the artist and in the work given that art ought to be performed with knowledge and a firm, constant intention, this commentator says. And the good of arts is found in those things done according to the art, and that making of art passes over to the exterior matter, and thus the good of that art is found beyond the one who produces it, and thus it is enough for those acts that those acts are held as good. For if they are considered to be done well, it appears that it is the the good of that art." End quote. While commentators on Aristotelian moral philosophy may want to carve out separate ethical spaces for artistic makers and their products, 
as we have seen both in, in this uh, Paris commentator and in the commentaries on the art of poetry, such distinctions are far less clear cut, with the poet's overweening will signaling a lack of virtue that leads to poor aesthetic choices. Horace's art, with its graphic examples of artistic creation gone wrong, is likely already in conversation with Aristotle's ethics, a text whose well-known and canonical status is reflected in other works of Horace, like, for example, in his, uh, one of the, his epistles, um, he quotes the Aristotelian dictum of the mean, uh, where he says, um, virtue situates itself between contrary extremes as far as it can be from one without inclining to the other. What is also clear is the degree to which the commentators writing on the art of poetry were familiar with both Aristotle's text and its paraphrase and commentary in the works of scholars like Aquinas and his teacher Albert the Great. The deployment of the mean as a key principle that is at once moral and aesthetic can be seen in both the ethics and in, commentator, uh, and in commentaries on the art of poetry. Let me take a drink. In book two of the ethics, Aristotle introduces the idea of the mean by presenting the consequences of the two extremes of defect or excess as destructive to the virtues. Aristotle says, so too is it then in the case of temperance and courage and the other virtues. For the man who flies from and fears everything is a coward, and the man who fears nothing at all but goes to meet every danger becomes rash. Temperance and courage then are destroyed by excess and defect and preserved by the mean." End quote. A popular 14th century commentary on Horace's art of poetry transposes this logic of falling away from virtue by embracing extremes to the realm of poetic composition. Uh, the commentator says, first he's, he quotes Horace, a fault may lead to error. Uh, this is uh, line 31 of the art of poetry. The commentator says, he, meaning Horace, declares openly that these five faults deceive poets who are not sufficiently cautious and who, while they are eager to flee any fault, not knowing how to observe the mean with caution, fall into another vice opposite to the first one." End quote. This hewing to the virtuous mean is echoed in a number of other art of poetry commentaries that take the example of line 28 of the art where, uh, I, I've got that line on the top there, um, where Horace's text says, the man who is overcautious and fearful of the gale creeps along the ground. So that is the proof text for the commentary. Um, so the commentator sees this line as an illustration of the fourth vice of writing, that of incongruous change of style, whereby the poet, attempting to avoid the bombastic extreme of high style, is akin to the sailor trying unsuccessfully to avoid a shipwreck by cautiously staying too close to the shore. Here I'm quoting the commentator. One who is overly timid because he does not know how to keep to the mean in avoiding the storm turns toward the shore and thus acts badly. For the ship is dashed against the rocks and is broken up. The poet behaves similarly, who in his insistence on the humble style avoids the high style as if to manage the storm ignorant of the proper quality of the humble style, creeps along the ground. So this is another line he's drawing on from Horace. This proof text says that he sinks to things that are lower than the subject matter requires and falls upon the shore, that is, onto discourse that is dry and without juice. And this is what is called arid and bloodless style, end quote. The application of such categories of virtue and vice, excess, and defect to the moral behavior of poets as crucial to the shaping of an aesthetically acceptable product speaks to the difficulty of removing the moral from the aesthetic and vice versa. The complex and multivalent rhetoric of making and craft in theoretical writing on poetics, moral philosophy, and theology opens up new avenues for thinking more deeply about what was at stake in the fashioning of creative products in terms of the objects themselves and their makers, but also uh, their readers. Written in Northern Castile, 
between 1330 and 1343 by a cleric named Juan Ruiz, um, which actually is kind of like a name which was akin to John Doe. It was so common. Uh, it was just a very common name. Um, so the Book of Good Love, in Spanish, the Libro de Buen Amor, instantiates and plays with the tangled discourse of moral theory and poetics to complicate and illuminate these stakes. The Book of Good Love is a loosely stitched narration of the efforts of a character named also the Archpriest of Ita, so that the author and the character share a name. Um, so they, they, it narrates his efforts to seduce a series of women, ranging from sheltered widows to guarded Muslim girls to nuns in a convent, most of who reject him. The author of the book conflates the vices of writing with the Christian concept of sin, since he gleefully indulges in the sins of writing, as set out by Horace and the commentaries, while his eponymous protagonist is doing his best to commit sins and in his wooing of women. Interspersed with the archpriest's efforts at seduction is a medley of generically diverse material, ranging from a parody of the canonical hours, vivid descriptions of the seven deadly sins, an array of moral exempla and animal stories, a bitter lament against death, and much, much more. In the pious sermon that kicks off the book, the narrator explains that his purpose in writing the book is to stimulate his Christian readers' memories of the good love of God and to provide them with properly fortified understanding and will in order to avoid the snares of carnal love, what he calls crazy love or love of the world. Yet he also affirms that if someone is more interested in learning the ins and outs of seduction and carnal love, uh, the book will also teach that art. And finally, the third function of the book, according to its author, is its function as a model of poetic technique, its mode of composition, thereby yoking it to its other overtly mentioned function, that of ostensibly giving readers the intellectum, the understanding, of both good love and carnal love so that they may school their wills in the pro proper ethical choices. So about poetic technique, he says, and I also composed this book to give some a lesson and example in metrification, rhyme, and artistic versification. For I have skillfully turned out lyrics, music, rhyme, and poems as this discipline demands. The book's authorial voice in a series of self-reflexive stanzas about the writing of the book and how one ought to read it uses language that locates the text firmly within the framework of canonical Horatian poetic discourse and its commentary. <coughs> when the author calls himself an inept tailor, an amateur tailor, the quotes up here, he is also alerting the reader that such a writer will necessarily be engaging in the second vice of incongruous digression. According to a 14th century theoretical text on poetics, uh, a useless, faulty, and superficially pleasing digression is meant to distract the reader from the inability of the writer to bear the weight of his topic and is referred to by the commentator as the production of a shabby textual garment that is made of rags and sewn together, exactly what the author here claims he's doing. This explicit application of the Horatian condemnation of purple patches to a ragged garment that is the result of incongruous digression is presented as a product of moral failure on the part of the poet. Such a poet functions as an exemplum, warning of the consequences of an overweening pride in his own abilities that leads to a failure to judge accurately the material he is unable to handle with the required serious assurance resulting in the misguided casting around for things his abilities can handle, even if those things are out of place. The vice of incongruousness or incoherence signaled by the, the, the book's author, uh, his self-description as this amateur tailor, is in fact explicitly embraced as the mode of treatment, the forma tractandi of the text, when he explains his method of inserting jokes into the text where he says, um, and because a man can't laugh at serious things, I'll have some jokes to insert here. Whenever you hear them, 
think only about the method of composing poetry uh, and song. The interruption of serious subject matter by jokes or other lighthearted material is a basic characteristic of two of the Horatian, uh, of the Horatian compositional vices, that of incongruous position of parts and the incongruous variation of the subject matter, both of which tend to bleed into each other in the commentaries. The insertion, or encherir in Spanish, of, of the, the Libro de Buen Amor author is a vernacularized version of the Latin of, of a 13th century commentary, which states that an incongruous variation of subject matter occurs when one abandons the subject matter at hand and interposes something else, uh, resulting in contradiction or con con contrariness, a fault which the commentator labels as monstrous. The monstrous nature of such abrupt variation of subject matter is not that different from the structural vice of joining parts that violate the norms of propriety as in the hybrid monster that we saw at the beginning of Horace's art. Like Juan Ruiz, uh, and I'm putting his name in uh, quotes because we don't really know if that's the author, uh, whose playful insertions are meant to focus attention on how he is playing with poetic technique. He says at one point in the text, only think about the method of invention and composition. The commentators view such disruption of subject matter as a kind of generic hybridity, a violation of the boundaries between comedy and tragedy when things pertaining to one genre are transferred to the other as one 14th century commentator explains. He falls into a monstrous variation when he introduces serious material into a light or playful treatise, or the playful into a serious one, and thus in one and the same work he is found contrary to himself as it were. The Book of Good Love not only claims to instantiate such a vice, but in fact practices it in, in the numerous shifts that it displays from the material of salvation, prayer, religious dogma, and theological discussion to shifts uh, to lyric, love lyric, body stories, and other kind of scabber songs that he includes. Not only does the author of the Book of Good Love engage in the purple patchiness of incongruous digression, but he signals them in ways that call attention, uh, that, that call the reader's attention to the seams of the text. The insertion of things that have no place there, that do not pertain to the matter at hand, as described by in the commentaries, um, often consists of set pieces of detailed description that interrupt the flow of discourse, deviating from its course, a vice condemned by the commentaries as useless and self-indulgent, done for the sake of pleasing oneself, and thus tying it to sin, both poetic and ethical. The sinful nature of this poetic fault is most palpable in the Book of Good Love, where the digressive material intervenes in treatments of sin and its consequences. This is exemplified by a digressive insertion into a mock epic Lenten battle of a segment about the theology of confession, the canonical rules governing the practice of confession, the granting of absolution, the performance of penitence, and the correct recognition of jurisdictional authority over confession. So after Sir Flesh, so he's one of the characters in this mock Lenten battle, after Sir Flesh and his army of meaty creatures is defeated by Lady Lent and her fishy fighters, Sir Flesh is taken captive and made to listen to the preaching of a friar in the hopes of his conversion and subsequent repentance. The author of the text then drops the narrative thread and launches instead into a detailed exposition of the ins and outs of confession, which is presented as akin to the repetition of a good lesson. This authorial voice that asserts itself when confronted with the task of writing this mini treatise on confession shares in the self-reflexive topical avowals of false modesty and lack of ability that preface the book as a whole, the amateur tailor kind of thing, thereby suggesting that the digressive disconnected nature of this patch of text is of a piece with the dominant aesthetic of the whole book. 
just as the author earlier evoked the possibility that his text may be the clumsy product of an amateur tailor. Here he repeatedly admits his little science or knowledge and invites readers to use their own knowledge and understanding to compensate for his lack. What I have in my heart to write down, I fear more than I can say. My scant knowledge gives me great fear of failing. Sirs, may your wisdom make up for my lack. I am a simple scholar, neither a master nor doctor. I learned and know little to be a teacher. You understand better than I what I might say. I offer my error for your correction. This invitation by the narrator to emend this digressive mini treatise anticipates the call at the end of the book to listeners knowledgeable in poetry to add to it, fix it, uh, emend it if they so wish. By casting himself as both amateur poet and an unreliable religious authority whose products are equally subject to revision, the author of the Book of Good Love reinforces the reciprocity between the discourses of poetic theory and religious moral doctrine, leading the reader to wonder about the moral framing of good love and crazy love or carnal love in terms of both poetic integrity or authority and their contested ethical formulation. In fact, the deliberate failure to close the book by welcoming its expansion or correction by readers constitutes an embrace of the Horatian sixth poetic vice, that of incongruous uh, non-completion uh, of, of a poem, uh, which is the result of negligence or ignorance here, um, not of circumstances beyond the author's control. He calls the lack of closure of his book, this is, he says, I will bring my book to an end, but I will not close it. So this lack of closure is contingent upon readers expanding it by adding to its repertoire of poems or expounding upon it, making a commentary upon it through extensive glossing in prose, is caught up in a dialectic of the contraries, large and small, abbreviation and amplification that are aligned in complex ways along the axes of virtue and vice, understood both in aesthetic and ethical senses. If the book embodies good love, buen amor, the expansion of the book would constitute an amplification of what is good. However, the author complicates the valence of good and bad, small and large, in his play on the third Horatian poetic vice, that of obscure brevity, a vice that consists in both the obscurity generated through an excessive cutting of things necessary, uh, but alternatively and counterintuitively to uh, an expansion when we in an outward appearance of rectitude tell more than is fitting. Uh, so the, shortly before the narrator ends the book but leaves it open, he expatiates on the qualities of small women using the compressed riddle-like dictum. When it comes to women, the best is the least. I don't have that here on there. So that, that's his, his riddle. So, por ende de las mujeres, la mejor es la menor. So, the best is the least. And he uses this riff as a jumping off point um, for thinking about virtue and vice of abbreviated sermons and small women. After delivering a very preachy exposition on how Christians should arm themselves against the devil and the world of the flesh, the narrator abruptly abandons the sermon for the very fleshly female bodies that the sermon was attempting to ward off. And here's this quote up on screen. I want, ladies and gentlemen, to abbreviate my preaching, for I have always liked a small sermon, a small woman, and a short discourse. For the heart, in, in the Spanish word means also memory, or, or memory is compelled by what is briefly and well said. He then goes on to describe small women using the paradoxical discourse inherent in riddles. Such women are simultaneously cold and hot, small in size, but large in sweetness, pleasure, love, taste, value, etc. Brevity here becomes not only a compositional poetic technique, but it is also charged with the connotations of virtue and vice, given its embodiment in the flesh of small women. While brevity is the ostensible reason for choosing to expatiate on small women, 
His discourse is anything but brief. He multiplies metaphors for small women. They are jewels, sugar, words, a grain of pepper, a rose, gold, taste, a bird. He does this over five stanzas. Hardly the compressed treatment that corresponds to the minimizing the evil or mal of women. And it also corresponds, uh, it, it does not correspond to the abbreviation of the inflated wordiness of pious sermons. Instead of performing abbreviation, he is carried away by the materiality of both women and language to perform its opposite, saying more than is necessary and still falling paradoxically into obscurity. Like Horace's art of poetry and other medieval arts of poetry, uh, which were understood by their medieval readers to teach by means of a double process, teaching about the art, de arte, the, its material, and ex arte, performing the art while teaching it, uh, the Book of Good Love's poetic process is also inseparable from that of its ethical effect. The poet's choosing to indulge in faulty poetic composition mirrors the ethical choices uh, about what kind of love to pursue and embrace made by the archpriest, who states that he is compelled to keep on both writing and wooing women. The book's playing with poetic theory as another means by which to interrogate the dynamics of ethics corresponds to acknowledgments in the 14th century of the literary dimensions of academic ethical discourse and to the ethical implications of aesthetic production. The numerous challenges to the reader posed by the Book of Good Love to choose the right kind of love, to construe the text correctly, and at one point he says, if you do that, you might actually get a girl. Um, I'm not making that up. And also perhaps to compose well, make clear just how difficult it is to sort out the tangled web of intellect, will, and desire. The enmeshed nature of the Book of Good Love's aesthetic form with the ethical problems it poses is part and parcel of an ethics not only of reading, but also of writing. And that's where I'll end.